podcasting for brands. I am the how dot com. Right, okay, so we'll uh, fade that rather nice uh, piano music out. Uh, Sound Art Radio 102.5 FM uh, and online. Uh, my name's Dave Clark, I am the How, and uh, this afternoon I'm joined by Daphna and Jonathan from Essence of Exeter. So, how are you doing? Oh, good. Thank how you good. Thank yeah. you. Excellent. So, uh, Daphna, just going to start off by asking you what you've been up to today. Um, well, let me go back. Um, I live in Exeter, so I was drawing with my kids, oh, and nice. I've just dropped them off at their very dear friend in Totnes. Oh, nice. So they're still on school holidays, I guess. Yes, they are. Lucky. One more week to go. Yeah. It's that time of year, isn't it? So, oh, it's such a shame their school holidays have ended, but actually everybody's really quite happy, apart from the kids. <laughs> They'll get over it. <laughs> and, uh, and, and Jonathan, how about yourself? What have you been, uh, what have you been up to today? I've been at work overseeing, uh, from, a, from a distance, uh, a bit of an IT calamity whereby um, <laughs> <laughs> all our systems um, seem to go down fairly regularly over the whole of the day. And I've been mm-hmm. trying to fix that um, with no IT skills, but trying to get people who could to talk to each other. Excellent. Well, actually, you know, sometimes not having any IT skills could be a benefit. I don't know, yeah. but uh, it's all going to work out okay, I'm sure. I hope so. Fingers crossed and all that. So, uh, yeah, Jonathan, so just in a word or two, what is it that um, Essence of Exeter provides? It's a, a network that um, looks after social enterprises, allows them to talk to each other, uh, gives them opportunities to network, mm-hmm. um, and to learn from each other. Okay, so this uh, this idea of uh, social enterprise, just just give me a little bit more uh, uh, what that kind of means. Uh, social enterprise is uh, a business, yeah, and it's a business that um, trades mm-hmm. and, in some circumstances, makes a profit, but uses profit for good or for social impact. Right. Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna unpack that a little bit later yeah. on. Okay, but before we do that, let's. Uh, Let's talk a little bit about how you both sort of came to came to the world of social enterprise, really. So, uh, Daphne, how do I, how, where, where do you want to start? Where, where, for, where did you grow up? What were your first kind of jobs? And uh, how did you uh, end up in the world of social enterprise in Exeter? Sure. Uh, well, I'm originally from the Netherlands. Mm-hmm. So I uh, went to school there and um, I did my master's in law and business, okay. which was fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. My first job was selling big coffee machines to big companies in the Netherlands Mm. and um, really loved it, actually. Really had a great time. Then um, I went to PepsiCo, the big company Mm. behind um, the crisps, etc. Had a big opening that I thought, what am I doing? Selling crisps to young children. Is this really what I'm supposed to be doing in this life? (laughs) And um, made a big turnaround when I was 23 only. So in the last, um, I'm giving my age away, mm. uh, 12, 13 years, <laughs> I've been on a path um, re-educating myself all around uh, sustainability, um, uh, social business models, um, what it is for us to become more human in the workplace, right. um, all of those things. And it took me from the Netherlands to England um, and social enterprise for me is a very straightforward way of um, finding a, a workable solution in yeah. this time and day um, for the challenges that we face as a human species. Wow. Now that's quite a, so that's actually, I mean, I'm just going to unpack that even more because I can only imagine that if you're working, uh, you know, with a big brand like that, the potential to in what a lot of people would consider, you know, career terms is mm. is huge. You know, you're, mm. you're in the door. Um, they tend probably to look after people. Um, you know, exciting uh, product development, brand development, marketing, mm. all that strategic thinking, planning, mm. you know, travel, income, all of that. Mm. So you kind of, what happened? Was there a, what was the moment? What was your epiphany? Well, very inconveniently, obviously. Um, (laughs) No, obviously, because I was fully educated to be in this in this world of money, success, you know, career, and um, 
a few trips to India probably uh-huh. um, I had my uh, world change yeah. and also a, a medical diagnosis for myself that just turned my world upside down okay. and from there um, things shifted very quickly yeah interesting because you know as you know uh, sp- speaking to people in the uh, world of social enterprise third sector or so on, you, qu- you you often hear people who have been in the world of big agencies, big brands mm. and so on, but they're actually in quite a sort of, you know, they're in a privileged position in that sense because they've had their career mm. and then they sort of reuse that phrase, you know, mm. they, they, they decide to give something back, as they say, which mm. is a bit of a sort mm. of dubious thing. But, but to do it at that sort of at the beginning of the kind of career is, is a bit unusual. Yes, I would say um, <laughs> I've never made that money <laughs> that I made when I was 23. <laughs> no, 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 quite. Uh, no. Well, I, you know, in many ways, yeah. I'm still living off the money that I made when I was about that same age working in mm. London for the uh, Financial Times, yeah. funnily enough. But there you go. Uh, so, Jonathan, what about yourself? What's, what's the story there? What, where, did you, where did you begin? I've worked, uh, always worked for the National Health Service. Um, so at 18, I went on a... Um, training scheme where I spent three months in different departments and depending on how much they uh, cared to direct you, uh, worked with patients or sat down and read books and things. Right. Um, hmm. Found that I liked audiology because that was very people focused and you could quickly get results even as a student and learn how to do things. Uh, and so that became my chosen specialty. Right. Worked in Nottingham for a number of years, got my training. Uh, briefly in Leicester and then I was a deputy head of department in Leeds Mm -hmm. had a fantastic job where I was allowed to basically go and uh, shape tests to find answers and so in the early days of of testing babies with different frequency sounds I've had a textbook and babies and electrodes and um, uh, had a lot of time to uh, to work on that Um, in terms of career progression I came down to Devon end of 95 Okay. As, a, as a head of department and the way the typical NHS works is you're, you're an excellent clinician, now you can manage. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and you kind of sink or swim and your service sinks or swim in relation to that. Um, had some success, um, was uh, the first president of the British Academy of Audiology, so uh, took things to a national level, uh, right. worked with the Department of Health a little bit. And then in 2010-11, we had the opportunity under something called Right to Request to spin our National Health Service Department out as a social enterprise and have a contract with the NHS rather than being employed with them. Okay. So we kept our terms and conditions, NHS salaries, pensions particularly yep. important, yep. and um, were then able to manage a budget, a certain budget, and do what we could with that money in order to fulfil the service needs. And if we found that we could save money in one area, we had to invest it in another area within our specialty. Right. So. That's where the term kind of not-for-profit comes, sure. Uh, but also enabled us to act commercially and make money in order to support the NHS service. So who's, I mean, who's, where did that idea come from? Who's, whose sort of idea was that to sort of, because it's quite a sort of uh, revolutionary thing to do. I mean, you could, you could just leave it as it was, you know, trundling along, probably fit for purpose. I think it was a, originally a Labour government okay. idea, but, but taken on by uh, subsequent Conservative governments as well. Um, to a greater or lesser extent, uh, but the idea was to uh, to free inspiration and to give people incentives to more to work more efficiently, okay. and to make the whole thing staff owned. So if people owned the service rather than working for it, mm. then they might be more motivated to to work better. Yeah, and uh, would you say that sort of on the whole is, is that how it's gone? Is that how it's... I think it's really really good. I think um, there's no other audiology service that's done it, right. and I would hold our service up as second to none. Right, interesting. So back to uh, essence of Exeter. So um, what is it? What's the sort of offer in in detail? What what do you provide to the community and businesses? I saw on your mm. website, for example, you've got Essence Connects. Essence supports and Essence represents. Mm-hmm. So, what what are those three to for uh, for a starter for ten? Very good. Um, <laughs> well, I'll take this one. Um, it's kind of our three lines of work, so to say. So, you Essence is a network 
So you can, it does everything that you can expect of a network. It connects people, the yep. members, which are in our case, social businesses and yep. people that are passionate about the social economy. Um, it represents them on, in areas like local government, um, other important stakeholders. And we provide business support either directly ourselves or we signpost to business support that is out there. Okay. So you're the knowledge hub. Is that, is, so you've got, you've got the understanding, the knowledge, the connections to take mm -hmm. inquiries and then signpost people or is, is it more practical hands-on help? Yes, well, we are sort of in a maturing phase, so okay. yep. <laughs> I wouldn't say we are the knowledge hub. Okay. Um, uh, our core business should be enterprise support and providing a container for individuals and organizations to grow, okay. um, if what? that's an answer to your question. Yeah, no, absolutely. So what kind of, what kind of businesses would, would come to you, uh, for example? Or, I mean, well, I should first of all say, you know, what stage is Essence of Exeter at? I mean, are you, mm. you're incorporating as a community interest company or you are established or where are you in that road? Yes. So in March 2018, we incorporated uh -huh. as a community interest company. Yeah. Um, that was after five or six years of voluntary uh, a group of people coming together, really wanting to see this happen. Right. Um, and um, in December 2018, we launched or relaunched our membership offer, which meant in our case that we were asking money for the first time okay. for people to be a member of Essence. Okay, so you've got a you've got a number of members yes. now. Yes. So what kind of so you know you don't have to give anything away, but mm. what kind of businesses are you would be your members? Uh, well, one of them is Chime Social Enterprise oh, okay. that Jonathan is the uh, managing director of, which a very large social enterprise. NHS spin out, right. but we also have startups. We have um, uh, a real food store okay. with local organic food in yep. Exeter. Yep. Um, so there's a wide variety yep. of members. Okay, so you got the, the, from the very very large. So you know, Jonathan, what, what kind of you know what kind of scale are we talking about with the sort of NHS spin out? Business? Yeah, okay. our, our annual turnover is something like three point seven million. Okay, um, and it's it's quite humbling. To, to be part of an organisation like Essence where you're with startups of one or two people who, who may just have got some grant money in order to try something conceptually. Yeah. And I've always found the social enterprise community, right from when we first uh, became part of it, extremely helpful. So everybody helps each other. Everybody's willing to share documents, share expertise, etc. Yeah. Okay, that's interesting. So, I mean... Um, as you may know, I think you do know actually because we were talking about this before, but uh, you know, Gareth from Iridescent Ideas... Um, came on this program uh, a couple of weeks ago or so and it was just interesting um, what he was saying about the um, this whole idea of social enterprise businesses becoming more um, normalized is that the, you know there's just mm. basically more and more businesses mm. doing that so mm. what's the what's the reason for that I mean why why would a for example you mentioned the sort of food um, mm -hmm. Uh, business. I, I'm imagining that, say, 10 years ago, they would basically have set out their stall, bought their ingredients, mm. sold, made a profit, invested in the business, taken a salary. You know, that's the kind of standard model. So why would they think, I know, social enterprise is the way for me to, to go? Mm. Well, I might have a little bit of a different perspective than Jonathan, but coming from the Netherlands, we would always look at England um, <laughs> thinking, wow, they've got a long tradition of social enterprises. And in the Netherlands, we kind of just claimed the the, the word okay. social enterprise. Uh -huh. um, so historically, we're always kind of looking at, at the UK of, of, of how things are being done. But then I think at the same time, the context has even changed in the last five years. Um, also, I think for, for in the UK, I'm imagining, but maybe I'm biased, is that there is just a, an increased perception around the urgency of the state of the world sure. and um, systems that are failing yeah. and um, what isn't working and also at the same time, little gems of what is working. Okay. That so it's, a, so it's a kind of, it, it's a, a grand form of word of mouth. People are noticing that they're, they're, they're feeling that there, there must be a better way of, or an alternative, more attractive way of, doing business and then there are people like 
essence of Exeter who are there saying, yes, there is, and we're here mm. to help you and provide you with all kinds of advice. Is that that's the, one way that it can yeah, go, yes. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. then we're also really learning a lot from our members. So. Okay, yeah, no, <laughs> no, I'm sure you are. I, so, would, I would say, yeah. Dave, that the, the difference perhaps is, uh, to use your example, if you start out and then made masses amounts of money and then decided you could be philanthropic and do something mm. with it, that would be, that's kind of the way that some people go. Yeah. I think social enterprise is more deciding at the beginning, yeah. we're not going to make massive loads of money. But if what we do make, okay, we'll take a salary, but sure. we're going to put that into a, a cause yeah. or, or a, a, a means to good. Yeah, no, that's interesting, isn't it? That's quite a, you know, it's a, obviously a, a distinct uh, difference. Um, but again, you know, I, I didn't do, uh, you know, a business studies or economist or anything like that, a study economy or anything like that. But the old sort of traditional model seems to me to be one of, you know, you, you start a business and you make money. That's, mm. you know, yeah. and, and I think it seems to me that, that isn't, I've always thought there's an alternative, just sort of intuitively thought, well, you know, it can't always be about the money. And I think a lot of other people, well, obviously, mm -hmm. you know, lots of people have that kind of idea, don't they? I, I think, yeah, that is uh, a generation of the millennials, I think they're called. Yeah. I think they are very much uh, value focused and value driven. Yeah. So they're looking for employers that are representing something on the value level for yeah. them. Yeah. So we're talking about, we're talking about, um, I think Gareth may sort of use this phrase, you know, building building a better economy. And by better, I think he means more, more than just one dimension, three dimensional, mm. something with a bit more value, something with a bit more meaning. Mm. Yeah. And um, what kind of, you know, what kind of models are there out there? I mean, are there, um, do, when people come to you and ask for that kind of advice, what, where do you, where do you start? I mean, do you join people up or do you have resources that they can look at? How does it actually kind of work? It really depends in what phase they are. Mm -hmm. So I can have a conversation with someone that has a concept mm -hmm. and is really ready for choosing their legal structure. Then I can help them in some ways. And if we are needing to get more nitty gritty, I can send them to an expert. Okay. But often when I have the conversation, they're so stuck on which legal structure it needs to have okay. that it's actually, I think that sometimes leave that a bit longer and work on your concept development. Okay. So there's one way of, of uh, yeah. someone entering our. Then we have social enterprises that are active in the care and the well-being sector, and that we're really seeing that there is um, that about half of Essence membership is is active in the care and well-being sector. Okay. So there is particular knowledge needed in that sector, particular types of conversations needing to happen. So we're actually having a little focus group now with these particular social enterprises coming together either for supervision or for one-on-one -on -one mentoring that we've got some experts in to mm. help. Um, that's another way that we... Interesting. So do you meet, so how does it work in terms of um, a bit of a nitty gritty? I mean, how do people come along to a particular place or do you do this mm. on, uh, through an online platform or a bit of both? Yes, a bit of both. Okay. Although since the 1st of June, we do have a desk. So it's quite nice <laughs> that people can walk through a physical door <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and knock. Um, and then a lot is online via email, uh, yeah. website. Yeah. Um, and I, I, in Exeter, I mean, I ride my bicycle and I try to knock on as many doors as I can sure. um, to go out and, and uh, uh, talk and connect. And the name, you know, essence of Exeter. So how far is your reach and, hmm. you know, is there a limit? So say, for example, I was in Plymouth, would I be able to come along to the essence of Exeter or would it be like, no way? Well, you could. Of course you could. <clears throat> we want, we don't, we're not there to compete with Gareth. <laughs> <laughs> no, I wasn't thinking of it, but yeah, good point. <laughs> No, so so Exeter area, we usually say. Yep. Uh, we have uh, probably 60% of our members are actually registered as a business in Exeter. Others are outside from Exmouth to Sidmouth to... Sure. Um, but the uh, economical activity, there is a link with Exeter right. or there is a desire to be active yeah. trading in Exeter. Yeah, yeah. Um, which kind of makes sense. I mean, it, sure. you know, it gives us sort of some kind of you know, container yeah. and, and so on. Brilliant. OK, so um, you're listening to uh, Wavelength. It's a weekly business show um, on Sound Art Radio. Um, it reaches uh, across the South Hams, 18,000 people plus your own network. Um, and it's a really good way to support independent media. Uh, if you'd like to get on the program, just search Sound Art Radio uh, or just Google I am the how. That's all one word. I am the how. Give me a call. And uh, we've got Dawn Wesselock 
she's a business coach. She'll be coming along uh, in a couple of weeks. Jonathan Forster, I think he's based in Topsham. Uh, multi-story thinking. He's an architect and a designer. Uh, he's also doing his own podcast, so uh, we'll talk about that. And uh, plenty of room in, I'd say, 2020, because we're kind of like um, racing towards the autumn. Didn't say Christmas, but... Actually, I just did, just said it. So, uh, Jonathan, um, so why do you do what you do? What's the kind of motivation in in the uh, in your line of work? What gets you out of bed in the morning? Oh, um, d- being able to influence people's lives is is what audiology is all about. Mm-hmm. Um, so, we're helping people who um, have hearing loss, who may be isolated, may be struggling in terms of their communication and hopefully giving them support and instrumentation in order to um, maintain an active part in society. So you, you mentioned when we were having a cup of tea, you were saying, well, I was having a cup of tea anyway, uh, you mentioned the sort of age range from the very, very young to obviously the elderly. So when you have a sort of newborn, how do you, how do you, how do you know whether that newborn can hear? Or not? That's interesting. The... Um, there's a universal screen happens with all babies now that's usually done by the health visitor mm-hmm. uh, that gives an indication uh, for us of, of whether we might do, want to do some more sophisticated testing or not. Um, so we see the babies that have failed that screen right. and we do something called evoke response audiometry where basically babies are asleep but they have some headphones on um, and some little sticky electrodes and we play them some sounds and we look for the responses in their EEG. Okay. Um, and if you do that over a considerable amount of time, yeah. and but you can build up a picture that, that where you look at and go, yes, I think yeah. they're hearing that, or no, they're not. Hearing oh, I that. see. So you're kind of looking in to their brain to see whether or not they are yeah. hearing something, yeah. or or possibly not. Mm-hmm. Gosh. And then if they're not, um, I imagine technology is very different to what it was, say, 20 years ago. So what are the kind of options for people with hearing loss? The technology and the tests are very different to to 20 years ago. Um, Depending on the level of of hearing loss, then a a hearing aid is probably going to be the thing to to go for initially. Mm -hmm. And that is something that is programmed via computer specifically to their hearing loss. So it's very, very much more catered to the test results that they're able to than 20 years ago where you had... With the best one in the world, you'd have a hearing aid and you'd have normal or high tone. Yes, yeah, okay. And now it can be particularly catered to the right. rest. Um, so kind of bespokely moulded to that person's yeah. spectrum. As Definitely. It were. Yeah. Wow. Gosh. And uh, Daphne, how about yourself? What's the, the looking at the world of uh, your work in, mm. in uh, essence of Exeter and, and, and that sort of social enterprise, what's the, what, what do you get out of that? Why, why do you... Uh, do this kind of work. I mean, we touched on that at, at the beginning. Mm. But I mean, I kind of understand why you may have left the world of big corporate, but what do you get from the world of social enterprise? Uh, well, it's a possible solution for changing the world for the better. Okay. And for me, and um, I guess I won't rest before more people <laughs> see that... Um, it only makes business sense to incorporate environmental and social gain into your business model. Yeah. yeah. If you don't do that, then there's no customer, there's no resources anymore in 10 to 20 years' time. Yeah. So I can talk to you completely financial about why you should incorporate the three Ps right in the heart of your business model instead of having it somewhere at the end sure. of your thinking. Okay. So what are the, th- what are the three Ps? Oh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> People, planet, profit. Okay. Yeah. I see. So, so basically, you're kind of, you're, so you, what you're saying is that all businesses should be thinking about people, planet, and profit. Whether you're a social enterprise or not. Or, or not. Totally. It so, makes business sense to do this. So the days of just thinking profit. We know that the economic model is is ending yeah Interesting. we know that growth isn't finite yeah, yeah, yeah. there this, this these things are hypotheses that are not correct so do you to get, say politely no absolutely so do you do you get um frustrated by you know when you listen to when you read in printed media or you listen uh, to 
television, radio, whatever, and you hear the economist still talking in terms of growth, 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 and not really giving much kind of voice to sustainability, you know, people and planet. They're just talking about, you know, we're not as profitable as the, you know, like, you know, Apple hasn't made as much money. Does mm. that does that kind of frustrate you a bit? Um, it kind of doesn't come in anymore. Okay. It just right. kind of bounces off. Okay. So... <laughs> As irrelevant. Okay, next. <laughs> and what about and what about your? Okay, let me put it another way. So, are you optimistic then? Um, some days. Yeah, but do, where do you think we'll be then in um, ten years time? Where do you think we'll be? It depends on the level of pain that people are feeling. I mean, otherwise we won't change. I right. mean, we're all part of the system that yeah. isn't working. So yeah. in our ability to work together, to talk together, to really want to understand the other mm -hmm. and to make something new together, that's what it depends on. And I, I have a desire, but I don't know. No. Do you think that we've got to go through a little bit more or quite a lot more pain before we kind of wake up and this becomes... Um, you know, first practice as opposed to something that we should be doing? I don't know. Don't I, know. I think it's not a, a linear formula that we can figure out. There are forces here at play that yeah. don't work. No. In, and are not in our control. Sure. Interesting. But they are a bit, I mean, we, they're not in your control, but they are, and they can be influenced. Totally. And, and that's why I get out of bed. Okay. Interesting. So you're an influencer but not in the social media sense. You're doing influencing in the way that we behave and the way we think about our work and the way we interact with each other. Yeah, I guess we haven't really touched upon that yet. But the network is doing what we are. We said it is doing. Sure. And we're also more and more um, engaging in more systemic interventions. Okay. So bigger flows of money. Where does the money come from? How does how can we make the money work for good? Mm. Um, so that's a whole new area, and the next twelve months will be much about that for essence. So I had the um, uh, well, it was a bit of a privilege, really. I came along to the simple event in Plymouth, and that's where we met, and we did a series of little podcasts there, which I think um, was was very interesting. Um, one of the words that came up um, a lot during that event was this idea of systems. Everybody was mm. talking about systems. Mm. What is that? Is that fair to say that that's uh, what does it mean? Systems, or is that too big a question? <laughs> It's very good. A uh, good question. I mean, there's all little ecosystems within ecosystems within ecosystems. So if you look at the food sector, who is active in the food sector? We've got the people that grow the food. Uh, we've got the people that um, um, process it, sure. bring it to the shop, shop to the consumer. Like there's, there's a whole chain and a web of relationships around a particular activity. Yeah. Well, that is a system, could right. be described as a system. Yeah. Or the system of care could be described as, well, we're ill, what do we do? You know, and then you can get all your options in a way yeah. uh, uh, on the radar of what that would look like. That is a system. Yeah. But this is a system. Sure. You know. But it's very difficult, isn't it? Because when you start thinking in terms of you know rather than thinking in terms of departments and silos where things are kind of you know one thing mm. depends on another in a sort of cascade mm. when you think of a sort of network a sort of um, a sort of global sort of uh, synapse of systems it it becomes really difficult to see because of because of the inter, in, interdependency mm. it becomes really difficult to see how you can change that but but I suppose we can, because the system's grown up over time, so it's just a different way of thinking. So we're not talking about changing things overnight, but we're talking about mm. consistent and pressured change to make change over time. Mm. Totally. It's, really? it's just as much a culture shift as culture. that yeah. there is um, just putting things in action. Yeah. Gosh. So, um, <clears throat> interesting. So, what do people say? Let's go back to the uh, essence of Exeter. So the people you're working with... What's the kind of, Jonathan? <clears throat> excuse me. What's the kind of what's the kind of feedback that you're getting from some of the organisations that you're working with? Um, well, we're working with organisations of all different sizes. Mm -hmm. So, um, in the meetings that I, I've been to, the feedback that we're getting, it, it, it's around 
startup questions. Okay. It's around where would you go to to find out A, B, or C? Do you, do we need? Um, do we, what sort of insurance do we need? Um, as, as Daphne was saying earlier, how might we incorporate? Incorporate. Yep. Um, what other kind of stuff? Um, I need all... someone to help me with my website. Who is that? It's okay. also on that level. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 But Where they do want... I go for my accounts? Exactly. Kind of, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. But that's good. I mean, that's yeah. those are the things that people. They are the they are the hurdles that will prevent somebody from, perhaps fulfilling their dream and their ambition mm. because they may have a great idea, they have got all the vision and all the motivation and all the drive, but they might not understand about company incorporation or accountants, and they might just think, I can't do it. So that's. It's also, I mean, it, it is about learning from each other. And mm-hmm. okay, on day one, Chime were a 3.7 million turnover business. Yeah. But how many of us had business skills? Well, we had NHS managerial skills and clini- clinical skills. So we had to get that quickly from other places. Right. And that equally could be for someone who's learned something as a startup, as it could be from, from anywhere else. So right. we learn stuff from small businesses and small businesses learn from us. And people with ideas. That's yeah. of, often people coming along. So within the organisation, uh, Essence of Exeter, who um, who does what? You've got a board of directors, an advisory board. So how does how does that work? Uh, well, we're small. So I, I chair mm-hmm. and we have two other directors and Daphne mm-hmm. is uh, does all the legwork. <laughs> does oh, all okay. the work, really. Um, it's true, you. isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> so could you do, are you looking for more... People, not resources, yes. that's a bad thing. But you're looking for more yes, people to are. join you. Yes, because we actually have more projects confirmed. Okay. Um, and hopefully uh, one or two more okay. uh, in the coming months. Right. Then uh, that I can uh, woman myself. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. So um, at this stage, uh, we're also looking at like how can we collaborate with the other social enterprise networks in the southwest of England. Sure. Um, uh, but because at the moment I'm doing the website, the books, I'm doing the membership <laughs> <Everything>. recruitment, <laughs> business development, yeah. you name it, it's me first. Yeah. And yeah. then, yeah. Yeah. anyway, okay. um, so that's how it's currently looking like. Um, and we are certainly in a growth phase ourselves. Great. So how, so when people will be listening to this now, people will be listening to this as a, uh, a repeat program, a podcast um so how can people find out more about what's going on the opportunities and how to get involved Hmm. well luckily um despite the horrific state of our website people know how to find us and are contacting (laughs) us Mm -hmm. but please do so via Uh www.essenceofexeter.org.uk um uh, also our our contact email is bsocial at essenceofexeter.org.uk we have a Twitter account and a Facebook account, which I'm obviously inviting anybody uh, to uh, follow and uh, befriend us yep. or like us, I should say. Uh-huh. And we've got a regular newsletter coming out every okay. six weeks or so. Okay. So Twitter's probably um, very straightforward, very easy, isn't it, to, to find you Essence of at Essence? It's um, Essence X. Okay. They'll find you. Yeah. And then they can just follow you. Facebook's yes. great. But actually, personally, I find Facebook a little bit confusing these days. Don't mm. know about you, but mm. just part of our community and yeah. audience is still using it. Yeah, and no, finds absolutely. it useful. Mm. Um, absolutely. So, Twitter, Facebook. Any plans we, for LinkedIn, or are you gonna... uh, not yet at no? the moment? We've okay. got monthly informal meetups. Okay. Because we want to get offline, because people value that person-to-person contact right. so much. So that's a sort of networking thing, isn't it? So. What's, yes. what's, what are the plans for that? So you're going to meet on a, a monthly basis? Yes, it? we're meeting on a monthly basis. Mm-hmm. We're part of the um, East Devon Jelly, which is basically a business um, initiative for yeah. people that are working in this area. And we're meeting up. And basically, again, what Jonathan already stretched, to just co-work, um, share inspiration, share skills. Yeah. And because um, uh, it can be quite isolating when you're beavering away at your at your idea or at your you know yeah. f- uh, stage of development, Tell me and about to get it. Mm, well, <laughs> and to get some other in- input, and also that, you know, we found a brilliant accountant through that, and um, um, some other people joined, and like they were coming to the jelly as um, thinking they would be a normal business, and they're actually quite interested in becoming a social enterprise. Right. So it's it's it's. 
it's just forming those webs of yeah. relationships. Yeah, really. yeah, totally. Brilliant. Okay, so um, going to wind up soon. Just <laughs> going to ask you before we go, what uh, what do you do other than work? So, Jonathan, how do you kind of relax? What are you doing in this lovely part of the world? Yeah, I need to relax. Uh, it's a pretty full time job doing what we're doing. Yeah. Um, I run. Okay. So I get out as much as I can. Um, yeah done a couple of half marathons and ambitions to do more right well how about that so kerry uh kerry reese wild running he's towards um kingsbridge he does a lot of swim run but run run, run slash tiny swim tiny events swim. so he's all about running and then i met a guy who's in your neck of the woods over towards uh tavistock uh cole cole kirk he's a cool. runner he's got a really nice um coffee shop and cakes oh. but as part of that offer he's got all the running shoes and he's a he's a physiotherapist and he concentrates on shoes and he's a no sort of um, no nonsense kind of guy so he likes to give you a cup of coffee have a chat and then talk about the kind of shoes if they don't fit he'll change them which is brilliant so sounds good yeah, yeah. and uh, Daphne what about you yes I love to run barefoot in the five finger shoes that is um, that is my thing that's, so that's no good is it I don't do that no. <laughs> that's you know Cole's thinking oh my lord don't start that trend so that's <laughs> interesting so five five fingered shoes otherwise known as bare feet is that mm. right yeah yes. okay and uh, just hiking, cooking, and I might have my first exploration on Brazilian jiu-jitsu next week. Oh. Wow. So, yes. Gosh, well, come back and tell us all about that. Mm, I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> and then, so what's next for the, what's, you touched on the fact that you're busy. Um, what's, what are the sort of up-and-coming projects and ambitions for Essence of Exeter? 12 months' time, when you're back here, mm. where would you like to be? Mm. Well, we're recruiting for new uh, members of the board mm -hmm. because we're in this growth phase. We could really do with some wider holding and extra expertise um, okay. to steering uh, Essence to the next phase. So in 12 months' time, we have some new board members. Um, anything else, Jonathan, that you see? Well, we've, we've a few irons in the fire in terms of um, grant money um, that will enable us to head towards this sustainable business that we're trying to create. Okay. So uh, in one year's time, maybe not sustainable. In a, in a few more years than that, then we want it to be a network that continues and yeah. continues to um, do good. That's not that's not a bad thing to aim for, is it? So a mm. bit of money to keep things going and some people to make it all happen. Yes. Wow, brilliant. Well, um, thanks very much for coming on. That's been really interesting. Thank you. And um, yeah, I've l covered a lot of ground there. Very Many thanks for this opportunity. Absolutely, thank you. Yes. Totally fine. I'm just going to say that you've been listening to Wavelength on Sound Art Radio 102.5 FM and online. I'm Dave Clark. I'm the How. Uh, I've been uh, talking uh, with Daphne and Jonathan from uh, Essence of Exeter. Uh, to get your business featured, search Sound Art Radio or I Am the How. Uh, and you can listen to this program again on Apple, Google Post Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, and many other podcasts. And just on that, actually, if you Google a business name and a podcast, like for example, Kerry and Wild Running, if you Google Wild Running podcast. Google brings up podcasts in its search results and you can play podcasts directly from the search page. Just, uh, you know, quite boring that really, but uh, nonetheless quite interesting. So uh, please share and subscribe. Contact me if you'd like to come on the show. Don't forget, it's your chance to support uh, independent media. Uh, thanks again for coming on and uh, see you in about four weeks because I'm going on holiday. Mm. Nice. Podcasting for brands. I am the house of Commons.